Hey there, I'm Josh Rushing, sitting in for Femi OK today, and you're in the stream. Has North Korea reheated its nuclear program? Today, we'll take a look at the evidence and discuss the implication of Pyongyang expanding its nuclear arsenal. Hey, and if you're watching this on YouTube, see over there? Join the conversation, right? Leave a comment in our live chat, and you too will be in the stream. North Korea's restarted nuclear reactor may mean that it's at work expanding its nuclear arsenal. It's aware that the UN watchdog monitors its activities via satellite, so that raises questions. Are we looking at another missile test or other provocation? Is it simply going to use this as leverage in future talks with the US or both? The Biden administration has a lot going on. There's Afghanistan, the pandemic, China, Russia, and more but it should pay close attention to this development and take any opportunity to begin nuclear talks with the North. Here to discuss that and more is today's panel in Washington, D.C., Jenny Town. Jenny's a senior fellow at the Stimson Center and the director of Stimson's 38 North program, which provides policy and technical analysis on North Korea. Also joining us is Jean Lee. She's a longtime journalist. In 2011, she became the first American reporter granted extensive access on the ground in North Korea. And Ankit Panda, he's a senior fellow in the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Welcome, everyone. Let's start with this satellite imagery. Jenny, I'm going to ask you to walk us through this. If we can go to my laptop, this is an image, it looks like from August 25th, over a reactor. But can you kind of walk us through here? What, what's the concern? Sure. So what we're seeing is um, North Korea's five megawatt reactor. It's a gas gas graphite plutonium production reactor. Um, and where the arrows point to the cooling water outfall, um, what this is, is this is usually a signature that the reactor is running. Um, and so we're seeing some of the wastewater being expunged, um, meaning that there's some kind of operations, whether they're flushing out systems or whether they're actually um, producing plutonium, it is uh, still in question. We would normally see a couple other signatures as well if uh, that would confirm that the reactor is running, but we at least know there's something going on there. Um, we have not seen this kind of activity since about 2018. Um, and this is important because, you know, during the past couple of years, North Korea has continued to enrich uranium, which is also used for nuclear weapons. Um, but it does need plutonium if it's going to build the more advanced nuclear weapons designs, such as thermonuclear weapons or even the miniaturized warheads. Um, and these are all goals that Kim Jong-un laid out in his Eighth Party Congress um, in January uh, of things that North Korea will develop over the next five years. And so to see this is really a sign that North Korea is um, continuing to move forward with its WMD development and, and advance its nuclear capabilities. Anka, do you know, could, could this be doing anything else? Does this reactor have any other purpose? Well, so uh, Jenny's absolutely right that plutonium production uh, is really the reason this reactor exists and the reason that, uh, you know, the international community has grown so familiar with the Yongbyon complex over the 30 plus years of uh, attention that's been given to this reactor and to broader facilities uh, nearby this reactor as well. Uh, I do want to add, you know, one just technical note is that while um, the reactor is the sole known source of spent fuel that North Korea reprocesses nearby for the production of plutonium and use of nuclear weapons, uh, something else that this reactor, I think, has an important role in producing in North Korea is uh, tritium, which is an isotope of hydrogen that's necessary for thermonuclear weapons, uh, which specifically, as Jenny pointed out, Kim Jong-un this January specifically called for the additional production of thermonuclear weapons. So it's a concerning and serious development. Uh, I would, however, emphasize a point that Jenny also raised, which is that, you know, this is not North Korea restarting its nuclear program. The nuclear right. program was never suspended. They were producing uranium all while the summits were going on with the Trump administration. Uh, it was just that this reactor was shut down in December 2018. And now it appears, according to the IEA director general, that operations have likely resumed. You know, looking at the timing of this, Gene, uh, let's go to my computer real quick. I'm just going to share a headline with our audience uh, and set this question up for you. It says, North Korea faces economic ruin amid food and medicine shortages. That's, that's a Guardian uh, article. And it says because of COVID and the, the border being shut down that North Korea is having a particularly hard time economically. Is, is that the case? And could that have something to do with what some might see as a, a provocation here? Well, there's no question that the last few years would have been extremely difficult. 
Okay. Hey, Gina, we're, we're having a bit of a problem with your mic. Let's see if our tech guys can get that sorted, and, and we'll come back to you. Jenica, I toss the same question to you. Is this a, a particularly difficult time economically for North Korea, and could that be part of the timing of, of, of this? Uh, it's definitely a difficult time um, for the North Koreans uh, with the prolonged border closed it, um, uh, shutdowns uh, because of COVID. Um, there's just been a lot of uh, a lot of problems um, that they're dealing with. Whether or not it's where the the timing is tied to the restarting of this reactor or not it is really unclear. There's been some other technical um, things that. Uh, that have been going on at the reactor over the past two years. Um, they have been working on um, the cooling system, um, which is also tied into the other reactor that they're trying to build, the experimental light water reactor. Mm -hmm. And it may just be that those technical issues have now been worked out and they're ready to move forward. Um, so I, I wouldn't connect all the dots so clearly. So there's a couple of uh, comments on our YouTube already that I want to bring into the conversation. Uh, Michael says, nobody has any interest in invading North Korea. Uh, Ricardo de Sousa says, North Korea will be testing the new USA administration to see how far they can go. Ankit, is this a test for the Biden administration? I don't really think so. I mean, look, the simplest reason for why North Korea restarted this reactor and is potentially producing more plutonium is simply because North Korea is a nuclear weapon state that intends on keeping its nuclear arsenal and expanding its nuclear arsenal. Kim Jong-un has been quite clear uh, back in 2018, before the summits with the South Korean president and the U.S. president, uh, Kim Jong-un used his New Year's Day address that year to call for the mass production of nuclear warheads. And of course, they've been producing uranium, and now it only makes sense that the reactor would restart. Uh, you know, i just add one thing is that um, in addition to the difficulties faced by North Korea economically and as a result of the pandemic, uh, in 2019 and 2020, uh, particularly in the summer months, uh, North Korea experienced uh, a, a, you know, a spate of nuclear, um, sorry, natural disasters, including flooding uh, at, at Yongbyon, uh, particularly dramatic flooding in 2020. Uh, so, you know, Jenny's right that, you know, they have been maintaining, uh, maintaining the site, conducting, um, pursuing upgrades to the cooling system. But it also is possible that the reactor restarting now instead of potentially last year or last fall before the Biden administration was even inaugurated may have been a result of unexpected damage from those natural disasters uh, and the flooding at the site. I want to bring in another comment. This is from Alejandro Chao de Benos. He's in Spain. He's a special cultural delegate for North Korea. Here, check this out. The only choice that a small country like the DPRK with 27 million people that it has to defend itself and uh, preserve the life of its citizens and to not end up like Iraq, Afghanistan and many other countries under the boots of the US imperialism is to develop uh, the nuclear power. By developing the nuclear weapons and more specifically the thermonuclear weapons, the country can secure that the, you know, if the United States is going to attack and invade North Korea, the country can answer into any uh, spot of the continental United States. You know, so, Jenny, why, why shouldn't North Korea have nukes? I mean, if he gets up the program, is an example of what happened with Gaddafi and Saddam, right. did he take a lesson from that here? Oh, he, he absolutely did. And I think there was a lot of discussion even at that time as if Gaddafi, if uh, Hussein had had nuclear weapons, would the U.S. have done, would those actions have had been taken? I, I think there is a case to be made. You know, there's, there's some understanding of um, North Korea is a small country, uh, and it is a small country in the middle of large powers. Um, and of other countries that have nuclear weapons, either their own or by proxy by the U.S. And so I, I think there was a serious um, security underpinning to that decision to go nuclear, um, although it does also serve other purposes as well, including, you know, the prestige, prestige of being part of the nuclear club and also um, the ability to coerce more effectively. Um, I think if you do look at the North Korean calculus and all this, they are still a country that is at war with the U.S. The, the war was never actually, it never actually ended. Um, it is only still an armistice agreement. So in order to really get to a point of being able to convince North Korea that this is the wrong path, 
Um, I, I think there are a number of security um, related issues that have to change and have to be resolved that would allow them the ability to make different decisions. But I think this whole approach of denuclearize or else um, has been largely ineffective um, and, the, and has, if anything, helped the North Koreans justify their actions um, more broadly. So, Gene, are you back with us now? I, I, was, I was hoping that you might fill us in a little bit on, on the people of North Korea and how they're affected by the sanctions and what's happening with the economy there and how that plays into this. Yeah, sorry about that. And what I was saying about the sanctions is there's no question that the economy uh, of North Korea has been hard hit. But I think we need to make a distinction between the uh, the regime and the people. Uh, the people have been sacrificed. Their well-being has has been sacrificed by the leadership for a larger goal that Kim Jong Un has. Um, I do I do worry about the everyday lives of the ordinary North Koreans and and. It was tough before all of this in the last few years, and it's got to be even tougher now. Um, but let's be clear, this is Kim Jong-un uh, treating his people like a human shield and holding them hostage to uh, this kind of hardship because he has a bigger goal. Uh, he is making certain decisions that is putting his people in harm's way because he has a bigger goal, which is to get his nuclear program to the point where perhaps the world has to treat North Korea as a nuclear power and that he'll a point where he can hold on to those weapons while perhaps negotiating some of them away. So it's a really tricky uh, question. You know, I think that we all care about the the state of the North Korean population, uh, but it's it's Kim Jong-un himself who is holding them hostage and is making decisions that is putting them in harm's way. But, well, what does that mean for the effectiveness of, of sanctions? Does the pain pass right through Pyongyang to the people and, and they don't get any kind of diplomatic payoff for it? So the, you know, these sanctions do, I, do, I do think that the North Koreans are incredibly clever. They've been dealing with sanctions for a long time. They are very clever and very good at getting around them. And sanctions are not effective unless they're enforced. So one of the challenges, of course, is to make sure that the sanctions are effective. And that is, that is a challenge. China, for one, and I would say Russia possibly, uh, they don't want to see North Korea crumble. They don't want to see this destroyed economy on their doorstep. And so uh, they will, even though they signed on to sanctions uh, that the UN has imposed, they may try to try to find a way to make sure that North Korea doesn't collapse. Now, and the other thing that I am very concerned about is how this is driving the North Koreans to look at ways to make money that they need, not only for the nuclear program, but also to keep their economy afloat. And so I'm looking very closely at cyber. Mm. How is all of this driving the North Koreans to Illicit, other illicit means to make sure that they're getting the money that they need to keep the people, or to keep the uh, leadership afloat and to keep that nor nuclear program uh, expanding. So if sanctions Josh, have like just, a... Yeah, jump in, Jenny. Just, please, please. Yeah. Do. Um, just to add to that, you know, uh, I agree with a lot of what Jean said. And, and the reality is, too, is that um, the effect that sanctions have really does affect the people more than the regime. The regime mm -hmm. will be the last people to feel that. And so the point of sanctions has largely been to um, to uh, deprive the regime of money and, and raise the cost of them making certain decisions and, and continuing to pursue their um, nuclear development. But especially the sanctions on commercial sectors, for instance, the people that get hit first are the fishermen, the farmers, the people who you know have now lost markets and, and lost things. And now with the border closures, everything is exacerbated because um, there's no longer the ability to get goods in for the people who were working in the markets and selling goods to get goods from China to sell in the markets. And so it's having the this whole COVID complication is having you know a lot of um, compounded effects on the people themselves. Um, but the people who will feel it the last and, and the least are going to be the elites, the one who we say that we're targeting um, the sanctions on. Yeah, so if you're looking at sanctions as the stick, maybe he's looking for a carrot. I want to bring in uh, Angela Kane. She's a Sam Nunn Distinguished Fellow for Nuclear Threat Initiative, who has a question about what can be offered to him. North Korea has been a nuclear power for some time already. 
It is always being demanded in the media that there has to be the complete denuclearization of North Korea. And to my mind, Chairman Kim Jong-un is not going to undertake this anytime soon. He wants to be recognized. He wants to be recognized as a nuclear power and at the same standing as, for example, Pakistan and India, who are also nuclear powers, but not in the non-proliferation treaty. So the demand of DPRK to dismantle all of the nuclear weapons, what is going to be the counter offer that is being given? And there is nothing right now. Ankit, do you have any insight on that? Yeah, so the North Koreans, I think, have told us on multiple occasions, uh, clearly and in, and in vaguer terms in some cases, what they're looking for. Uh, at the Hanoi summit, for instance, in February 2019, mm -hmm. uh, the North Korean request was for the United States to offer a, a very sort of large package of sanctions relief, mostly focusing on the UN Security Council resolutions that were uh, passed in 2016 and 2017 with Russian and Chinese support at a time when North Korea was very rapidly expanding its qualitative capabilities insofar as its nuclear deterrent was concerned. Apart from that, on the security side of things, uh, there's a basket of measures that the North Koreans call uh, the hostile policy, uh, U.S. hostile moves. Uh, this includes everything from the provision of U.S. extended nuclear deterrence to allies in Northeast Asia, to physical U.S. Um, the presence of U.S. troops on the Korean Peninsula and nearby in Japan, uh, North Korea effectively has asked for the United States to pull these uh, back. Um, it, it I, when it comes to negotiating on North Korea's nuclear program, though, uh, you know, I do tend, I do tend to think that in the short term, the more promising path ahead, especially if we're to shape Kim Jong Un's choices, uh, short of total disarmament, and encourage North Korea to stop qualitatively advancing its capabilities or to stop the quantitative growth of North Korea's uh, weapons-grade fissile material, for instance, um, having some kind of package of sanctions relief that could be implemented with snapback measures where if the North Koreans were to cheat or to not make good on their word, those sanctions could be reimposed may have some promise. Uh, but yeah, the North Koreans have told us what they're looking for. Uh, on the notion of North Korea sort of, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I think makes doing diplomacy with North Korea challenging is that while it is true that North Korea uh, has developed nuclear weapons after leaving the NPT, it's not comparable to India or Pakistan because neither uh, New Delhi nor Islamabad ever actually joined the NPT to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that North Korea pulled out of the non-proliferation treaty, developed a nuclear arsenal, I think, makes international diplomats quite careful about uh, how we approach this problem because we don't want to set a precedent uh, whereby North Korea is seen as enduring uh, a little bit around two decades of intense sanctions uh, and other measures, and then effectively gets away with developing a nuclear arsenal. That, I think, would set a very dangerous precedent for the non-proliferation regime more broadly. So a couple more questions from YouTube. Uh, Karen Le uh, Leanne says, diplomatic discussions are better than sanctions. And lost my password says, has Kim Jong-un expressed any signs of wanting real dialogue? Jenny, I, I'm also curious to add to this. It seemed like in the Trump administration, things took a weird turn there for a little bit. And I'm just curious, where are we now? Has it reset to back before or did things change because of Trump's different approach? And is Kim Jong-un interested in having similar meetings with Biden or do we know? Well, you know, during the Trump administration um, and and actually several times, the North Koreans have committed to denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And, and certainly there's some loaded a meaning to some of that. Um, but this idea of are they willing to negotiate? Yes, they're willing to negotiate. Um, but the reality is, is that they're not going, that doesn't mean they come to the table and simply put their nuclear weapons on the table and say, here, what can I get for this? This is a process, um, and like I said, there is some security underpinnings to their nuclear program that also need to be addressed in that process. And what you mm -hmm. saw in Singapore in 2018 um, was an agreement to an agenda that included that relationship, um, changing the nature of the security situation, changing U.S.-Korea DPRK relations, working towards a peace regime, and working towards denuclearization. And these are all things that need to be done sort of in together. It's not just about finding the right sanctions package. Um, it is about creating an environment in which, again, North Korea can feel confident in making certain choices that it will benefit them and they won't bear the brunt of that decision in the future. Um, what we have now with the Biden administration is a revert back to the kind of language we had in 2016 
um, where the relationship is talked about in, in this threat dynamic. North Korea poses a big threat um, and a focus on denuclearization only as the goal. Um, and so if you're the North Koreans looking at this, um, you know, already Kim Jong-un expended a lot of political capital in 2018 to go through with the summit process and didn't necessarily get anything tangible to show for it. He's going to be more reluctant to come back to the table now, especially if there isn't a real sense of what they're going to get. And the public messaging, other than the being willing to meet anytime, anywhere, doesn't give any indication um, that outcomes, especially in the short term, are really possible. Um, and, it, and it's almost as if the language is like 2018 never happened. We're really back to this threat scenario um, and this real focus on denuclearization. So it, but I'll just jump it's in. a reset. Can I just jump in with... Yeah, yeah, please do, Jane. I was going to say, but, but at least uh, we're, they're starting, the Biden administration is starting from this complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Not to say that I support that language, but in a sense that they're not going all the way back to 2016. In a sense, they are starting from the language that was laid out in Singapore in 2018. And so not starting completely from zero, I would say. Uh, but remember that uh, the following year in 2019, that Kim Jong-un left Hanoi. He had to get back on a train for 66 hours or whatever it was, mm -hmm. and he didn't have anything to, to, to show for it. And so he's not going to go back to a negotiation. I mean, I do think that he wants a negotiation, but he's not going to go to a negotiation unless he knows he's going to get something out of it, right. unless he's in a stronger position. And in a sense, what we're seeing now with the, the restarting, the possible restarting of, of, of this um, portion of Yongbyon, and maybe we'll start to see some other types of provocations, is uh, expanding the, the arsenal, right, so that they are in a stronger position if and when they get back to that negotiation, and also creating a sense of urgency, uh, knowing that the Biden administration is distracted, trying to create a sense of urgency in the region uh, about their nuclear ambitions. I have another comment I want to bring in. This is from Daniel Pinkston. The, he's the international relations lecturer at Troy University. And he speaks a bit to the mindset, I think, of uh, Kim Jong-un, maybe. The southern part of the Korean Peninsula already has been denuclearized. South Korea is in full compliance with its nuclear nonproliferation treaty commitments. However, North Korea has demonstrated over decades that the leadership is committed to producing, acquiring, and deploying uh, nuclear weapons. I don't believe North Korea will abandon its nuclear ambitions unless the leadership abandons its uh, hostile ideology towards the rest of the world. They view the world as a menacing uh, environment where North Korea is constantly under threat. Anka, is, is, a nuclear, is a North Korea nuclear program inevitable? Well, I mean, the program exists, but them being a full nuclear state, is it inevitable? Well, I mean, they are they are a nuclear weapon state today, and I think they intend to retain that status. We've already heard about some of the reasons why they've decided that this that nuclear weapons are an essential component of their national defense strategy. Uh, everything from prestige to practically deterring the United States. Um, I do think that they will um, retain this for the long term, unless uh, you know the fundamental conditions that today they perceive to exist in the international environment around the Korean Peninsula were to be transformed. I don't see. That happening anytime soon. Uh, you know, there are also other geopolitical dynamics underway, including the U.S. generally increasing its military presence uh, in the Indo-Pacific region to compete with China. That while I think having effects on the U.S.-China relationship will also enhance North Korean insecurity, simply because the U.S. will have additional military assets and attention in this part of the world. So unfortunately, I think you know we are in for the long haul. I don't want to say never. You know, I don't want to say that North Korea will never give up its nuclear weapons. The nuclear age itself is quite young. Uh, we, we have less than 100 years of experience as a species with nuclear weapons. Uh, but certainly, I think, over the next few decades, uh, Kim Jong-un, at least as long as he's alive and as long as he's leading North Korea, I find it very difficult to imagine the kind of internal and external developments that would have to take place for North Korea to fundamentally revisit the use of nuclear weapons. In right. Defense. Right. Thank you, Ankit. And thank you, Gene and Jenny. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave the conversation there. A big thanks to all of our guests and to you, our community, for joining the discussion. Until next time. We'll see you online.